we'll launch straight in. Um, <clears throat> the title is European Energy Policy. And because so many of us are based in Ireland, we pick some Irish examples, but really many of the points are equally valid you know, for Paraguay, Brazil, and certainly for Norway and Germany. And it's worth, first of all, stressing that not just energy, but resources as well, by which I mean natural resources, are our lifeblood. And that's true as much for post-industrial societies, so-called, as it is for developing societies. You often hear people saying in a country like Ireland, oh, we don't really want dirty industries, we're, we're post-industrial. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, server farms are very heavy users of electricity. They might take a third or more of Ireland's electricity within eight years. Uh, and of course, if you look at your average EV, electric vehicle, it weighs more than twice as much as your average internal combustion engine. So in no sense can we say that post-industrial societies have got beyond raw materials or energy. And just to be a bit parochial, just this last week, we were reminded of the importance by, by two major companies. Intel uh, announced it was going to do its next big project in, in Israel rather than Ireland. And it, it mentioned that uh, while generally experiences in Ireland were good, the very high Irish electricity cost was a major constraint on future development, not just for Intel, but for the whole uh, IT sector. And then we also have a quite a large zinc mine owned now by Bulliden, one of the oldest companies in the world from Sweden. And they just shut, at least temporarily, um, officially because of uh, uncompetitive energy costs and a dip in the zinc price. But of course, if you follow the industry, you know that's nonsense because the zinc price is about $2,200, $2,300, quite a good price, in fact. And they continue to operate their mines in Sweden and elsewhere. Uh, and what was really going on there is that while they found a major increase in their ore body about 10 years ago through the use of seismic, it's about 800 meters from the current mine, about 1,000 meters depth, uh, they cannot effectively expand and add reserves uh, without good faith cooperation from the authorities. Uh, and it's not that the authorities have made any public statement against mining, but what they've been doing is passive aggression, not just in zinc mining, but oil and gas and other sectors as well, simply dragging their feet on permitting and extensions, things which are essential to the development of a 21st century mining industry, whether it's lithium in the South American Triangle, uh, or uh, nickel in Northern Europe, or indeed zinc in Ireland. I would go so far as to say that policy is choking enterprise as we turn against business. And if we have time, I can give you more examples. Recent example would be uh, a, a major Irish company called Tier Lawn uh, recently expanded its creamery um, plant in a state-of-the-art plant. And that plant, I understand, was delayed for some years, although there was strong market need for it, costing the company 104 million euro. Um, and the main reason was that a state-funded NGO on Tashka, which is Gaelic for treasure, uh, led objections on the basis that dairy contributes to greenhouse gases, which is in breach of our Paris commitments. Um, so it's, it's one of many examples we could give about how policy in Europe is choking enterprise. And I'd go so far as to say that greenery as currently practiced, and of course, uh, if, if I could turn around the screen and show you uh, my um, back garden, you'd see the, the ocean and the rocks, and uh, I, I love the environment as much as anyone, but greenery as practiced in Ireland and, and in much of Europe has really become a cult uh, and an anti-business cult, uh, in, in, in many cases replacing some uh, parties of the hard left. And the first point is, um, uh, if I can flick on, it's trying to move on. Wait a second. It doesn't seem to be moving forward. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, oh, sorry. David. Now it's moving. Apologies. Uh, I don't know what happened there. It wasn't moving forward. So uh, I think a point worth making, and this is a distinguished audience, and, and, and uh, please be patient with me, that humans aspire to better lifestyles which in turn requires economic growth. Now, that may seem obvious, but I have been in debates with parliamentarians uh, from the far left and from uh, the Green Party, including MEPs, uh, and uh, who have made statements like, I'd say to them, Look, would you be happier in a beehive hut, which is the type of um, uh, fairly um, sparse 
architecture that was used by Irish monks about 1,500 years ago. And after coming out of the studio, one of the left-wing uh, members of parliament actually said to me, yeah, I would quite li- like to live in a wigwam. So I, of course, suggested to him that he put this in his uh, manifesto in the next election, which for some reason he's declined to do. But most people want progress, and that's true in Chinese cities. It's true in rural India. It's true in Latin America. In my experience, it's true almost everywhere. Um, and energy, moreover, is critical to progress. In fact, energy drives progress. And I'll give some examples. And I would say drive civilization and, and very much technology. I would go so far as to say energy is what makes us human. Sometimes when you talk to people at the hard line, they act as if technology and energy is some sort of reason add on. Maybe it's a thousand, two thousand years old. It's not really essential to human beings. Uh, but of course, if you look into the history of energy, you see that that's not true at all. That we, our ancestors have used energy by which I, I mean fire for nearly as long as we've been uh, uh, Homo sapiens. And indeed, other hominoids have also used fire. Yes, there have been energy transitions in the past, and I can take you through them if we have time. But in every case, energy transitions take time, decades, if not centuries. They've never displaced traditional fuels. You know, coal doesn't displace wood, wood didn't displace other biomass, and so on. And they are always driven by economics and utility. Uh, they're never driven by ideology. Yes, there are examples of, say, German princes and uh, Japanese shoguns in the Middle Ages who protected forests, but uh, they didn't drive uh, an energy transition from one uh, fuel to another. Uh, Another point that's often made or implied is that resources are finite on planet Earth and we were using five planets worth of raw materials. But of course, that's, that's a great untruth, as you can see repeatedly throughout human endeavor. Resources are effectively infinite in the universe and close to being infinite on on planet Earth. What we need is technology and tax terms and and, uh, logistical access uh, that allow us to develop resources. We don't need to ration resources, except in in very short-term emergencies like maybe the world wars. And of course, the, the obvious point from the point of view of looking at humans and technology is that the assumption that we can simply freeze technology at the level of 1950 or you know pick your pick your date and time and people will be happy uh, forevermore clearly doesn't work if you take a long-term view because planet earth is finite our sun is finite uh, we know that our sun will eventually die and i know it's going to take a long time but we're told that we should think in the long term so if humans are to survive as a species and we may not survive two billion years to worry about it but if we are to survive clearly we have to have the ability to migrate and use resources uh, on other worlds. Uh, and that's why I think that when you hear words in French like décroissance, you know, for degrowth, it, it is effectively economic suicide. Now, some of the people on the left in France will tell you, oh, we don't mean that your per capita income is going to fall. We just want to achieve it through pure productivity and not economic growth. But the reality is that if you look at examples in the past, when people try to turn against uh, development of technology. And a well-known example would be 15th century China, uh, when the Chinese, uh, with all their sophistication and uh, trade surplus, felt that they could live without the barbarians. Um, We're right, maybe for a few generations, but ultimately that turned to catastrophe for for Chinese people, with results that are still uh, working their way out today. I say energy drives civilization. Because if if you look at what separates us from animals, it's very striking that, you know, animals use chemical energy from food and sometimes ambient heat. You go on safari, you can see animals stretching out early in the morning as they warm up, especially lizards. Uh, But maybe the big difference between the animal kingdom and hominoids generally is that everywhere you find evidence of fire. Like I have been in the Amazon and Peru and Bolivia and we, as part of our job, we've made uh, addresses to local communities, talleres or workshops in Spanish. And we have to actually track down the communities and we've got to invite them to the taller and we've got to present to them in their indigenous languages. And I, I often, uh, there's some things we do with them, one of the things we always try to play football with them and always it's the same result. You know, we have uh, a game of football with uh, guys our own age and we usually beat them narrowly. Then the next day, all the young guys come in from the bush and of course they hammer us in the game. And that seems to be a universal. 
everywhere uh, in the world that you go, whether it's Africa or Latin America or whatever. But uh, one of the questions I always ask the elders is, how long have your people used fire? And invariably, they say, oh, we've used fire from time immemorial. No, we, 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 we had some contact with the Spanish, you know, over the generations. We fled into the bush because we were being enslaved. And in recent years, we've come back because of the value of trading. But everywhere you find that fire is embedded in human nature. So I dug into this just out of curiosity. And I found that in Europe, we are actually technological laggards in that we're only proven to have used fire uh, for over 400,000 years. If you go down to South Africa, where we're mining diamonds, about an hour's walk away, uh, they have found remains of 3.3 million years or so old. And there's evidence for at least 800,000 years of continuous use of fire by hominoids in caves in South Africa. And uh, in East Africa, they're much more ancient again. At least one and a half million years ago, fire was used by hominoids in parts of East Africa. So if you think of humans as having been, in our sense, um, humans for maybe three or four million years, maybe truly intelligent for two or three hundred years at the most, and you realize that fire almost everywhere is more ancient than that, then you realize that fire is not an optional extra. Fire is part of what humans are. In fact, I would say even it is what humans are. Yes, animals, and I've seen it myself, birds uh, can pick up burning twigs and use those burning twigs to spread fires to catch prey. But uh, as far as we can see, no other animal has the ability to create fire. And if you look at the history of human beings, uh, initially our ancestors used fire opportunistically. You know, you've all read your Bible or your Holy Quran, and you've seen all the references to the burning fields of Kirkuk and uh, the burning bush in the Old Testament and so on. Uh, and if you've ever been to Iran and you visited Zor- uh, you learn that fire has been preserved uh, in a sacred way for at least 11 centuries in Yazd, in the center of, of Iran, where we, we discovered a mine. Uh, uh, but finally, of course, humans developed the ability to kindle fire at will. And I would say that is the, the birth of technology in our sense. Yes, they were able to fashion wood and um, stone tools prior to that. But fire enabled them to process raw materials by cooking food, leading to a great leap forward in the amount of protein they could uh, absorb. Purified water, it's often forgotten. You go into the Amazon and you, you, you take uh, stool samples from people uh, in, in Peru or Bolivia or Colombia, you know, from indigenous tribes. They typically have 50% uh, very severe um uh, uh, in it, well, uh, parasites, uh, you know, so purification of water was a very important part of the development of, uh, of healthy humans, as well, of course, firing ceramics, metals, glass, and so on. Uh, and really, I, I would say that the, uh, the definition of progress really, to a large extent, is energy concentration. We started with food, then more rich foods like meat. Uh, we moved on to biomass. And in some parts of the world, you could still see ladies collecting biomass in the Sahel, uh, they uh, spent about four hours a day walking around collecting you know, twigs, uh, bush, um, very often dead wood. Uh, but we moved from that to timber. First of all, low value wet timber, then drier, higher value timber. Along with that, of course, development of technologies like sailing from wind, uh, later water and windmills, uh, then coal, uh, which has been used since ancient times. But the big leap forward from our point of view was the development of deep coal. And that, of course, required pumps, which in practice, at least in Europe, meant some sort of engine uh, and biomass available in Europe at the time simply wasn't uh, powerful enough uh, to drive the pumps with low efficiency that they had. Uh, so you, you, you had the development of the steam engine, which in turn allowed them to pump water from coal mines in northern England and in turn uh, fed the steam engines, which of course led to the, the industrial revolution and so on through hydrocarbons and into uranium. And if you want to look at a um, uh, an illustration, this is, this is a good graph which summarizes many of the trends just over a couple of hundred years. Now, if we went back in time, you'd see biomass has been fairly consistently used, uh, depending on where you look in the world for hundreds of thousands of years. And you can see that in terms of tons, um, basically, well, we've all heard about the early Industrial Revolution in England and Scotland. The reality is that not much uh, hydrocarbon was used until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and it was the very time when agricultural productivity leapt forward. 
Later, uh, you had the development by German uh, engineers and chemists of artificial nitrogen fixed fertilizer. Um, and you had the Industrial Revolution, which was really powered by coal. Later, at the end of the 19th century, the development of oil in and then in the Russian Empire and elsewhere. Uh, and that, in turn, led to the development of natural gas, uh, with nuclear being developed since the 1950s. And what's interesting, if you look at this uh, graph, this brings out the point that nowhere, once a technology has developed, it's never superseded by other technologies. It always finds its niche somewhere. And also, while much talked about and massively subsidized with lots of investments, uh, renewables are still fairly minor. You know, natural biomass, for the want of a better name, is fairly constant, in fact, larger than for most of the time during human history. Uh, but the you know, modern biofuels and solar and wind are, are still relatively modest. I mean, maybe hydro is about four and a half percent or so of total primary energy and all renewables together, maybe about five and a half percent. You know, so big difference between the numbers as they're generally um, imagined by people and the reality. And um, to look at a shorter period of time, this really brings out the same point uh, that primary energy consumption uh, does change quite slowly. I mean, it, it, uh, the bar graph on the left um, gives you the the overall picture, but uh, in some ways, it's it's uh, fun to look at the percentage changes on the right. And, and normally, the percentage changes over the periods that we're looking at. This is from 1995, projected. Um, a few, well, um, not uh, not not projected forward in this graph. In the next graph, it will be, and you can see that. What, what's really striking about this graph is how stable the, the numbers are. Yes, renewables is growing, which would be a surprise if it weren't. Nuclear is actually fairly stable as a percentage, but of course, it's a, it's a story of two halves. You've got relative decline of nuclear in the developed world after Chernobyl and later Fukushima particularly, uh, but growing in countries like Vietnam, India, China, and of course, very strong in uh, the Russian Federation uh, hydro fairly um, fairly constant um, because while hydro is a very clean fuel, it requires a big upfront capital investment and there's more and more resistance to development of new hydro facilities. Go back to the 20s and 30s, there was no big resistance to damming a river in the Norwegian Alps. And that's one of the reasons why Norway became so important in aluminum and ferro alloys and so on. Uh, now it's, it's much more of an issue. If you look at hydrocarbons, you see that Despite all the, the hype about the death of coal and COP26 calling for the end of coal, the reality is that coal is used today in more tons this year, 2023, probably than any year in human history. Natural gas is growing despite the um, sabotage to the Nordstrom uh, pipelines. Uh, and oil is in relative decline, uh, but not an absolute decline. This may well be uh, at 103 million barrels a day. This may well be the biggest year for oil uh, in 160 years. So standing back a bit and sort of asking ourselves, uh, you know, what does what does energy mean for civilization? I thought a nice way of encapsulating it, uh, taking a very long view, is to use Kardashev scale, uh, which you know, if, if you if you remember, Kardashev was the great Soviet cosmologist whose scale was um, publicized by uh, the science writer Carl Sagan in the 1960s. And basically, what uh, Kardashev said was. Uh, you can define all civilizations by their ability to use and store energy. So if you look at planet Earth, in an ideal world, if we could use or store all the energy which hits planet Earth or comes from geothermal industry, energy within, that would make us what he called a type one civilization. Type one is ability to use 10 to the 16th watts, which is a lot of power, obviously. And uh, I think he reckoned at the time we were probably about 0.5 uh, maybe 60 years on, maybe we're 0 0.6. So we're well short of, you know, the, the bog standard for civilizations, even with our current industrial um, uh, civilization. If we got to the stage where we were able to use all of the energy from our solar system, um, we would uh, increase the energy use by uh, about, um, uh, you know, 10 to the 10, to the 10th, uh, which obviously is a huge difference. And if we made maybe the, the final leap to being able to use all the energy in a whole galaxy, uh, we would increase the uh, type two level civilization to a type three level civilization, which would be um, 10 to the, the, the 20th more energy than we're using today. So I think it was intrinsic in the vision of these great scientific visionaries like Kardashev that humans are far from finished. We're not at the point where we want to stop science and growth 
and go back to our beehive pots. We haven't even started on this wonderful journey that we're on and that we must continue if our species is to survive. And uh, um, on, the, on the theme that energy is, or sorry, technology is energy concentration, it's worth just going over some of those points and that, you know, people say, why do we go back to wood? Uh, and it's a very fair question, you know, and it came home to me when I was down in, in Santa Cruz in Bolivia uh, with the Irish Consul and we were making a big parilla to bring people around. And uh, we started the parilla with wet wood, hard wood, but wet wood uh, from a tree that had fallen down um, on, on the consul's uh, land. And uh, we found that it's very hard to get a decent fire going with freshly cut timber. But if, if you dig out some old dry timber and freshly cut timber in that part of Bolivia, it might be for hardwood 40, 45 percent moisture. The driest you'll get for uh, one or two year dry hardwood might be 15, 18 percent. Far easier to start a fire, generates far more heat, cooks meat more quickly. Um, and, and that's a fair summary of what wood does. Wood performs low intensity tasks like deterring predators of cooking food quite well, uh, although it's quite inefficient, wood fires. But even using bellows, which of course is projecting an airflow uh, at a multiple through the, the fire itself, wood is really of limited use, as our ancestors found out. You can refine gold, you can refine uh, lead, copper, uh, and get to bronze, just around about 1,000 degrees Celsius, melting point, uh, but you cannot touch you cannot consistently make good bronze and you cannot make iron. To make iron, as the Celts found out, uh, unless you find a meteorite and you hammer a sword or sickle out of a meteorite, uh, which did happen in antiquity occasionally, to make any sort of industrial iron, you need a consistent temperature of at least 1500 degrees Celsius, which is quite hot. Uh, and you can't, you simply can't get there uh, by even the, using kiln dried wood. Um, but our ancestors were very innovative and they learned how not just to dry high energy woods, they learned how to make charcoal, which, of course, is very slow burning uh, wood, particularly hardwood in uh, oxygen poor environments. And that generates actually very high quality um, fuel, which is nearly pure, 99 percent carbon. Uh, and um, I wouldn't have done my note to charcoal because when I when I worked in Brazil in the 80s, I was astonished to find that some of the finest steel in the in the world was made by Brazilian companies using 100% pure charcoal, uh, and apparently it was at least as good, if not better, than the best metallurgical coal available in Europe at the time. But of course, you need a lot of wood to make charcoal, and of course, a lot of time. And uh, a point that's worth bearing in mind is that as technologies develop, they tend not to develop uh, in a linear way. Um, and, and you find this even in our own time. You know, it's, the, the pump didn't suddenly develop under its own and, and you didn't go along to your local hardware store and buy a pump so you could dig a deep coal mine in Yorkshire. That's not how it works. What happens is technologies tend to evolve in parallel um, and uh, one technology assists the other. Um, and uh, we see this in our own time, like in my own industry, the development of offshore exploration in the last 30 years has gone from, Oh, you know, if up to 500 meters in the Irish Atlantic would have been state of the art in the 1980s to Petrobras 15 years ago, drilling in four kilometers uh, in the Santos Basin in the, you know, the subsalt of Brazil. And now drilling three and a half, four kilometers is not so unusual, even in West Africa and Southern Africa. Uh, but it wasn't one technology that enabled us to go offshore. It was a whole series of technology, you know, new raw materials, 3D seismic directional drilling, GPS, and so on. Another example would be hydraulic fracturing. Um, and it, the, the industrial revolution from which come all our benefits, you know, the, uh, in time, the, the dramatic reduction in infant mortality and births and childbirth, um, the much longer life of human beings. Just to give you a quick reference, let's go back to the Amazon. Uh, when you see the children in the Amazon, I can show you photographs, everyone says, oh, these children are so healthy. You know, these are the noble savages that Rousseau talked about. But these are people who romanticize the past. If you get your paramedics to actually uh, help the kids out, you know, killing parasites, curing malaria and so on, you find that on average only 50% of those kids survive to age five. And that's one of the reasons why uh, very often the elders don't even name children until they, their fifth birthday. And they found the same thing in Mozambique uh, during the war. 
um, infant mortality, 50%, and life expectancy, both for women and men under 50. And that's the reality of the noble savage. Uh, you know, we may we we may give out about our modern lifestyle and its stress, but like in a country like Ireland, you've got what eighty three life a years life expectancy for a man and about eighty six or more for a woman. Um, so the, the 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 industrial revolution brought us these these wonders with all of its industrial accidents and the Dickensian conditions, um, uh, uh, but it needed coal and it was fueled by coal, and uh, the first steam engines were only one to two percent efficient. Now compare that with a modern Siemens gas fire turbine, which might make 60 or even more percent efficiency, or even a very basic technology like an open uh, open cycle um, uh, gas fired uh, uh, generator that would be nowadays 29, 30%. So we've come a long way from one to 2%. But those machines could simply not have been fueled from the biomass then available in Europe. And you, you couldn't have moved enough coal um, or you, so you, you couldn't have moved enough uh, charcoal from Latin America or elsewhere to, to fire the Industrial Revolution in Europe. So there simply was no alternative to high-grade coal. But what was interesting about the Industrial Revolution was even relatively low-grade coal was able to overcome wood shortcomings. And um, uh, an example would be how Germany, you know, quite quickly in the 19th century, Germany uh, went from, Germany was always an innovator in, uh, in machinery, Germany, by which I mean, uh, German speak in Switzerland and Austrian Empire, as well as uh, the German principalities. Uh, and the, they went to England to develop their technologies, mainly because that's where the venture capital was. So an, a Bavarian or an Austrian entrepreneur going to Northern England was a bit like an Indian going to Silicon Valley. Uh, and if you wonder why there was so much venture capital in, in Bristol and Liverpool, well, the reason was to do with the triangular slave trade. You know, people who made a lot of money had capital available to invest in new technology. And of course, coal succeeded because it was much more energy dense than than any sort of biomass, even though it had been used in small quantities in the ancient world. Uh, and of course, coal is very much with us, um, and uh, uh, and and still to this day is the key driver in electrification in China and India, uh, which is why the the volume of coal is so so big being uh, mined and consumed today. And you can see this just very quickly on the um, the graph of coal output on the left and coal consumption on the right. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, the reason why um, we in Europe often have this very narrow view of coal in decline is because uh, we don't use a lot of coal now. It, it's been in decline for decades, relatively speaking. We still use it for metallurgical coal, but that is in Asia Pacific. It's a huge export earner for Western Australia, particularly. And it's both burnt and mined in China and India, but also in Indonesia and Vietnam and other countries. South America has relatively little coal. Um, there's some in, in uh, Colombia and some in Santa Catarina, Brazil, but the Brazilian coal is relatively low grade, which is why uh, Brazil developed charcoal for metallurgy. Uh, and another way to look at it would be that this shows you how electricity is generated according to region of the world. And you can see that it's a very different story depending on where you are. And if you look at um, at Europe, which is what, what most Europeans do, you get a totally misleading impression. Europe is basically you know, quite quite a, a high penetration electricity market, about 23% electricity market of total primary energy, which is quite a lot. Um, but if you look at the, at the bar, you can see that almost no oil, which you'd expect, it's very inefficient to burn oil for, for electricity. Uh, quite a bit of natural gas, which traditionally is from North Sea, Croningen, uh, Russia and North Africa, uh, and still a lot of coal. And coal, in fact, has bounced back since the Ukraine war. Um, and also nuclear is still quite strong in Europe. Uh, hydro is quite strong in certain places like the Alps and uh, Norway. Uh, and renewables uh, does have a base. But what, of course, they don't tell you is that all of the renewables, at least the intermittent renewables that are not hydro, all of them are backed up by reliable power, which in practice means natural gas or even coal. Um, now, compare Europe, which is relatively uh, in decline and only about 15% of primary energy now, with Asia Pacific. And you see a totally different story. Asia Pacific is coal uh, and a little bit of gas and a little bit of, um, of nuclear and hydro. Um, if you look at South America, well, South America is largely hydro because of uh, Iguazu and Ticori and run of river uh, projects in places like Colombia and Peru. Um, and quite a lot of natural gas. Uh, 
uh, North America because of the fracking miracle is natural gas, but still quite a bit of coal, although coal is being displaced by frack gas. And of course, as you'd expect, the former Soviet Union very much um, gas fired coal and nuclear. And the, the Middle East, of course, is oil and gas. Um, and another way to look at it is to look at the inputs, which of course are, are greater than the outputs, uh, and look at the graph over time with some projections. And you can see that you know, the, the, the constant stated story that coal is dead is, is certainly an exaggeration. Um, standards have improved, uh, and there's a considerable effort you know, on carbon capture and storage, but coal is not dead and is unlikely to die anytime soon, despite the hype. Now, the energy industry has certain qualities about it that we should bear in mind. Uh, just before we came on, um, we had a brief discussion about it. And the, the, the most obvious point, and this is the oil uh, price graph from the very earliest beginnings in the 1850s until recently. And the, the, the light green line is the, the US dollar, i.e. the US dollar of the day, not Confederate dollars, the US dollar of the day. And the dark green line is the inflation adjusted price. So I think it's more helpful to look at the inflation adjusted price. And you can see that um, both prices have been very volatile over time. And that has obvious problems because some of the time, about a third of the time, the price is way too high, which of course, like today, deters necessary investment um, uh, because people tend not to um, project forward high prices. They tend to assume a lower price from the point of view of going to their board or, get, or raising money in, the, in Wall Street or the city of London. Um, but similarly, it can be a problem when prices are too low, which they are also about a third of the time, because when they're too low, that also deters investment. And that's why the energy market invites regulation. And it's it's very striking that um, in the very early days, prices were, were, were really quite crazy. Like um, if you work out the average volatility in the oil price in the early decades before Standard Oil became dominant and started fixing the price, it was an average of 51% change per year between the high and the low um, monthly price, which is unbelievably volatile. Uh, we think we live in volatile times uh, and very hard to plan forward. I, it was either a few cents a barrel or it was too many dollars a barrel. And that was the reason why Standard Oil developed and Rockefeller developed all these price fixing maneuvers. And he did manage to reduce the volatility of the oil price, but not as by as much as you'd expect, only by an average of about 25% from the 1870s until uh, antitrust was developed in the 1890s. Uh, so it was still quite volatile, 25%. And what was really interesting is after the Antitrust Act, which is a bit like our European competition uh, law, and the American Supreme Court actually broke up Standard Oil, the volatility only went back to about 32%. And the reason was that the former executives of Standard Oil became the executives of the baby standards, Exxon, which was Standard Oil of New Jersey, Standard Oil of uh, California, which is Chevron, and so on. And they continued to act to some extent as if they were Standard Oil executives, which was in the very, very much in the best interest of the United States, of the consumers, and of the industry. Uh, and they got very good returns and were able to grow internationally without extreme volatility that would undermine investment uh, and, of course, harm uh, consumers periodically. And that was a big reason why the United States uh, emerged victorious in World War I and World War II. Um, however, um, uh, even that was not sufficient when the Great Depression hit in the 30s. And one of the little known things that uh, FDR did during the, uh, the New Deal was that he fixed the price of oil quite strictly. Um, and uh, Joe Kennedy, the great Joe Kennedy, um, picked the Texas Railroad Commission as the regulator for world oil. Easy thing to do. But the reason was that they were uniquely, for much of the South, they were almost free of corruption. They'd done a brilliant job in uh, safety, including in railroads, until that was taken away from them. Uh, and they weren't too... Um, uh, strict about uh, the letter of the law. You know, if you were cheating on your pro rata, they weren't uh, behind riding into your uh, your oil field and setting your rig afire. Um, so it was very effective. And in fact, the oil price volatility fell to an average 3.2% until 1970, the flattest curve that it's ever been. 
And it, it only really lost its power uh, when the United States started to import oil, oil rather than exporting oil. And then after a brief few years, you had the rise of OPEC and we went back to like 90% volatility. And that's the reason why the industry invites regulation, whether it's by the state or by a company or by a cartel. Uh, everyone agrees that you have to have some sort of control on the natural wild swings of the market. Why do they swing? Because at the margin, oil for some uses can be worth thousands of dollars a barrel. Whereas at the other margin, uh, you can produce it for maybe $2 or $2.50 uh, in a southern Iraqi or uh, eastern Saudi field. And part of the reason why you, you have no right oil price, someone was asking what's the right oil price. This shows you uh, from uh, Equinor, the former stat oil. These are two supply curves done out by stat oil in the, 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 the noughties when the oil price was moving up very vigorously. One is that a low a low um, priced environment of what we thought was low 2003 and what was a high priced environment 2008. Uh, but what's really striking, although the two prices are quite different for the supply curve, what's really striking is the differences between the high cost producer and the low cost producer. They had the low cost producer in a high price environment as a little as a, was $5 and the high cost producer uh, as nearly $70. And that what that tells you is there is no right price. Um, you know, in a squeeze, you can make money at $100 um, or $80 offshore Brazil, or maybe up to $95, $100 in Canadian tar sands. But in a price war, like we saw uh, between um, 2014, 2016, uh, people will cut, like the Saudis will cut uh, below their full cost in order to discipline uh, unruly competitors. And that's why you need regulation. Um, and, and of course, it's not just a, an economic thing. Uh, it's deeply uh, strategic, uh, the, the, the need that people have for reliable and affordable energy. Uh, and uh, it's not an overstatement to say that great powers actually rise and fall according to energy access, cost and quality. Um, you, you, most people on this call would know that the, the Royal Navy uh, uh, was dominant after Trafalgar uh, by the use of sail, but as quickly as it could, the Royal Navy converted capital ships to coal. And one of the reasons why it made sense for the Royal Navy to move to coal was that it had higher energy content uh, anthracite in Wales than in Germany, or indeed in, in Japan. Uh, but even so, what was really interesting is in 1914, before the breakout of the Great War, Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, embraced oil fired ships as a principle due to the higher energy content of oil. Now, that seems a ridiculous thing to do because Britain had the best um, anthracite. Why would you go to oil when you had no oil fields at the time, uh, requiring the intervention in Iran and long communications, which could be targeted by U boats and were effectively targeted in the two world wars? Uh, and the reason was that, uh, taking a long-term vision, Churchill could see the value of higher performance ships. Uh, but of course, uh, typical of Churchill, uh, it took decades for his vision to be transformed into reality, although they did convert submarines, the fast patrol boats and aircraft, but so did the German um, Kaiser uh, armed forces, and of course the Americans as well. But I think it's not an exaggeration to say that the central powers actually lost World War I due to insufficient natural resources and, of course, allied blockade, uh, which caused the, the scarcity. Central powers won World War I militarily. They defeated the Russians. Uh, they were defeating the, the French and British in the West until the Americans intervened. Uh, but um, in the end, what pushed the, the army back was really the starvation of people, both in Austria and in Germany, leading, of course, to the myth of the stab in the back. Um, and that's why, uh, if you read Mein Kampf, you know, Hitler was very aware of this, you know, of the need for natural resources in Germany's poverty in natural resources. It had low grade coal, poor iron ore. It brought in its iron ore from Sweden through Norwegian waters, uh, tungsten from Turkey and so on. And to a large extent, you can see the axis drive both in the Pacific and in Europe as a drive for Lebensraum and resources. Uh, but of course, the irony of World War II is that the Axis powers lost the war largely because of lack of natural resources in, in wars that were largely being fought for natural resources. And you find the same conundrum with China and its Belt and Road Initiative today. So uh, why then do people always worry about natural resources? Well, uh, I think to some extent, the petrophobia that we experience today uh, echoes Malthus in the 18th century. Um, which uh, Malthus was a very intelligent Church of England clergyman, and uh, 
by the standards of his time and the technology available to the 18th century, England was a state of the art. And I think he worked out what England could sustain about 21 million people or so, and they could import some grain from Ireland and all the rest of it. Uh, and given the assumptions that he was using, he wasn't so far off. But of course, resources never run out because they you, you cannot assume away human ingenuity. And again and again, the Malthusians have been proven wrong. Malthus in the 18th century. In the 1920s, uh, dig out the old um, newspapers quoted by Daniel Jurgen in the book, The Prize. They worried that American oil was running out because shallow reservoirs were uh, being depleted, 1920s Texas. But then, of course, they learned to drill. Uh, then you had the clubs of Rome and Paris, like when I was an undergraduate in Cambridge, Ted Heath and others spoke earnestly of the fact that, you know, our civilization wasn't going to survive into the uh, 80s. Um, uh, the same sort of talk that you heard later on with peak oil. Um, and I can remember as late as 2010, you know, one of our financial gurus, a guy called Eddie Hobbs, uh, published a book saying, you know, that, that peak oil was about to hit uh, at the very time, the very time when the industry had quadrupled the resource available through hydraulic fracturing. Uh, and uh, it's it's something, it's an idea that never seems to go away. I, I was in a debate about nuclear with the current Irish energy minister, and uh, we were talking about peak oil and um, uh, and we were talking about, you know, the need for substitutes. And I was saying, well, look, you know, uranium, um, uh, you know, we haven't really explored for uranium and we should really develop uh, modern technology with, with safe nuclear power. And he said, ah, David, there's going to be a peak uranium as well. And I said, well, Hey man, how can you say that? You know, and he said, "Look, you haven't added many more years of reserves than last um, fifteen years." So I said, "Well, what happened fifteen years ago?" And of course, Chernobyl happened fifteen years ago. So, you know, people stopped drilling in Saskatchewan, and of course, the fall of the Soviet Union meant that they weren't drilling in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzia. Uh, it wasn't for lack of resources; it was for lack of drilling because drillers need financial incentives. And this is a classic fallacy, which is almost impossible to explain to politicians. They always extrapolate from proven barrels or tons. Sometimes, if you're lucky, maybe from proven and probable, but they never consider all potential resources uh, because they don't understand finance. They don't understand that investors need incentives to explore. And they always ignore the evolving impact of technology and price. What we saw with the development of steam engine, offshore oil in Brazil, Frack in the US and all the other examples. Um, but um, before we laugh at uh, petrophobia, these sentiments drive business cycles. Peak oil drove the oil price high in up to 2008. And uh, then it uh, uh, the idea that the death of oil, uh, the end of oil, you know, the development of clean fuels, that drove oil price unnaturally down and has led to underinvestment in exploration over the last 10 years. So what I'm arguing is that our, our policies, and this is the same in, in Paraguay and Brazil as in Europe, our policy should be practical, not ideological. The priority should be reliable, affordable, and then safe and clean energy. Intermittent sources are additional, not replacement, and they always increase cost. People always ask you, what is the solution to the energy crisis? As if they're looking for a magic solution. And the soundbite would be, you know, wind, offshore wind, or even nuclear. That's a soundbite. But as we've seen by looking at past energy transitions, there is never a silver bullet. Even in the 19th century, late 19th century, at the very time the United States was developing, we still used vast quantities of wood. Why? Because wood was plentifully uh, available close to the industrial bases. Whereas in Germany, in Japan, and England, uh, there was less wood available, it was more expensive, and there was more of an incentive to go for coal. And a reliable system requires diversification. It is foolish to depend on any one source, whether that's North African gas um, or offshore wind uh, or coal from an English mine or whatever. For reliability, you need multiple sources and multiple routes to market. And if you ever wanted to see a better example, it would be the attack on uh, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Uh, at the same time as Nord Stream 2 was completed, Turkstream was completed, and Turkstream is flowing 31 half BCM, um, as, are, as are indeed are the pipelines to Ukraine. And if we didn't have that diversification, Europe would have no gas now, and you'd have a very different gas price and a very different winter, last winter and next winter. And as a generalization, 
domestic or close by supplies are safer than imports. And it's a pretty obvious thing. Uh, people didn't accept it before the Ukraine war. Now everyone accepts it. Pipelines are better than trying to truck. They're much more efficient. They're environmentally more friendly. They're much safer. And yet, what do environmentalists protest against? They protest against uh, pipelines from Alberta into the United States. They protest against um, the development of new pipelines from North Africa to Europe, and so on. Um, pipelines are good. Friend relations with key suppliers are also necessary, whether you like uh, their politics or not. Uh, on these measures, European, follow, European policy fails on every measure. Think back over what we talked about. 1960s, there was over-dependence on OPEC oil imports uh, rather than resilience. Um, tax structures, where they were developed by countries like Holland over the Groningen gas field, later by Britain, they generally sought early state income rather than energy security. Now, sometimes countries got lucky, like in Norway, they had bad tax structures, and there were still major discoveries. For a, home, a small country, they were able to develop $1.4 trillion of sovereign fund. But I think that was pure luck rather than good planning by the, the Norwegian Labour government. And post-1973, there was, correcting the overdependence on OPEC, there was a drive for domestic coal, nuclear, and North Sea production, which was was successful to a large extent, but there was also a uncritical drive for um, Russian gas, oil, and coal from the Soviet Union, um, rather than uh, the fast development of offshore gas or fracking, uh, or indeed LNG. And um, the original, uh, this was always sensitive, by the way. I mean, the Americans always were unhappy. Uh, it wasn't a new thing. It wasn't Newland or Biden that thought of the idea of maybe attacking the Nord Stream. Uh, right from the very first development of the Druzhba pipeline system from the communist countries into Austria and Germany and elsewhere, there was bitter American opposition. Uh, and the Americans were stood up to by Margaret Thatcher, of all people, as well, of course, um, Gerhard Schroeder, sorry, Helmut Schmidt and um, uh, Mitterrand. Um, and the original deal with the Americans was that we would have no more than 15% dependence on uh, Russian gas. But of course, that had grown to over 40% by 2021. And in the case of Germany, 55%. Uh, another mistake, you know, classic mistake, you, you, you have insufficient diversification. Um, and at the same time, as we were too dependent on uh, Russian gas, we were retiring coal and nuclear capacity, prioritizing intermittent renewables, in a policy that was exactly back to front and not for the first time. So, as we've said, intermittent electricity cannot be compared with reliable electricity generation because it is, is additional. Now, there are some societies that rely on, on intermittency rather than on reliable. Um, and I was recently in South Africa where we're mining diamonds um, and they have eight and a half hour uh, cuts of electricity every day. Uh, but being such a well-run Calvinist society, they actually tell you, you, you go and stay with the um, the Boer farmers uh, and they say to you, well, David, have you charged your battery? Or, or have you charged your battery? Because we will be cut off at 4 p.m. Uh, my Afrikaans accent is not great. And uh, two minutes past four, you can be sure the ESCOM will cut you off uh, you know, for a number of hours. But in case you laugh at that, because we have candles and we have wood fires and all the rest of it, um, one of the things that happened when we were uh, on walkabout is um, we nearly drove over, over a black mamba, and I was in the back of an open um, uh, peck, of, and the, the, the Boer farmer was freaked at this. So I said, well, you know, what's the big deal? He says, the big deal is that a 550-kilo cow was killed by a black mamba just last month. And if it can kill a 550-kilo cow, it can kill an 80-kilo man. And, um, uh, and I said, well, don't you have snake venom? And he looked at me and said, David, to make snake venom, you either need dollars to buy it, which the ANC don't have, or you need a continuous, reliable source of electricity to make uh, anti-snake venom, which we also don't have in South Africa. So there is effectively no reliable source of anti-venom in South Africa, which to me was a shock. I mean, the country that was the first um, heart transplant, albeit in the racist times, uh, can't supply anti-snake venom to its people. Um, uh, now, uh, why wind turbines? Why are they not um, an adequate solution? Well, first of all, they only develop and uh, deliver effective power about 20, 25% of the time. Ireland is actually quite good. You're more towards the 25% of the time. But there is no large scale or cost effective electricity storage. Now, people will talk about 
uh, pumping it up Turlock Hill, which is supposed to have 60 megawatts of capacity. But you talk to the ESB engineers and you ask them the hard question and they'll say to you, well, we once got 21 megawatt out of it. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, yes, it's nice to have pump storage. It's quite inefficient, uh, but really it's not an adequate replacement for reliable power. Um, and wind and solar, despite all the talk about levelized cost and all the talk about wind being free, these are the systems. Now, I'm not saying you never use them. We're looking at using a solar plant in the Kalahari you know, to develop a, a diamond mine. But in the Kalahari, we have 350 megawatts, or sorry, with 350 days of, um, uh, of intense sunshine and a relatively low use uh, in a diamond mine of power. Um, uh, and uh, you know, when 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 people talk to you about levelized price, you know they're BSing. Forget the language, because uh, if you go to the supermarket or you buy you know a liter of milk, you, you don't pay the levelized price of milk. You know without um, capital cost. When they go to the pub and buy a pint of beer, I don't pay the levelized cost of beer. I pay the cash cost. Uh, so what you should be looking at is the cash cost. And it's interesting that in countries like Ireland and Scotland, I think Germany too. Um, wind developers require a guaranteed price of 160% of the market price on average over the last 25 years. Uh, but even then, the contracts that they sign are only enforceable against the grid. They're not enforceable against the developer. And, and for years, I made this assertion about contracts for difference, and I wasn't believed. And then, of course, what happened during the Ukraine war? Many of the wind developers sold in the spot market rather than under the subsidized price. And despite all the hype about you know, being forced to um, to waste energy and um, uh, to curtail, as they put it, electricity. If you actually go through the records, uh, especially the audited accounts, uh, you see that there is, in fact, very little wasted electricity. There, there are small amounts uh, of electricity that are curtailed. Um, they claim, the Irish uh, Wind Association claims 25% of the time. It's actually true about 6% of the time if you look at their own data. Um, much of the time, you know, they're actually taking power off the grid rather than putting it on the grid. Then the other great white hope, of course, is hydrogen. But of course, as we all know, I think here, hydrogen is a, a it's really a source of supply or a source of um, con uh, um, a containment of energy rather than an original source of energy. It's not like a hydrocarbon, with, with odd exceptions. Sometimes you find hydrogen like helium in reservoirs where there is radioactivity and hydrogen and helium are, are products of the radioactivity, but not enough to power a, a power station anywhere as far as I can see. And to make hydrogen, you have to overcome the hydrogen bonds, because unless you make it from natural gas or coal, the only way to make green hydrogen is from breaking hydrogen bonds in water. Hydrogen bonds are very strong. You lose basically half the energy in breaking the bonds, and then you use another half of the energy in liquefaction. Uh, and leaks. Um, so hydrogen uh, is really not a economic solution until, unless you make the hydrogen from natural gas. Uh, now, by contrast with Europe, the United States and indeed Latin America is generally more pragmatic. They're not perfect, but they're generally more pragmatic. Um, as you can see, um, the US uh, has had an energy policy. You know, the people who say the United States has no industrial policy has never looked at energy. They did have antitrust, but as soon as the depression hit, they had government control of price, which was very effective. Um, and they were an exporter. And to a large extent, I would say they won World War II with oil. And they supplied huge quantities of oil, even to the Soviet Union, which was a, an oil producer to itself um, during World War II. Um, and um, uh, uh, when the United States uh, began to lose its power, when it became an importer, the United States governments, successful governments, encouraged U.S. companies to expand internationally, which they'd been doing since the 30s. Uh, and uh, they um, had major nuclear and power and, and coal uh, power industries and were quite prepared to intervene periodically to support their oil interests, whether in Mexico in the 30s uh, or in Venezuela in the 50s. And, of course, in the Middle East as late as 2003. Uh, hydraulic fracturing in our own time has transformed the United States from a big, the biggest importer, uh, 20 million barrels consumption, produced about 5 million barrels in 2003, to a net exporter recently. And in fact, in those, those years, from about 2005 to 2015, the United States was adding more fracked barrel capacity than the entire growth in world demand with China and India and all the rest of it. 
from two relatively small projects, you know, the Texas Permian uh, for oil and uh, the, the Pennsylvania Marcellus for gas. So the United States has been hugely successful. And as a result, the gas prices have stayed at very low levels, uh, switching from LNG imports to 13% of LNG international capacity. Now, Ireland is the opposite end of the spectrum. If the United States is a reasonably shrewd uh, energy policy, Ireland is a disastrous one. I mean, few economies are more dependent on imports, 100% of oil, 75% of gas, and we import this gas through two uh, Scottish interconnectors. So at the same time, during the Brexit negotiations that we were being threatened with having food and medicine cut off by the British Home Secretary, uh, we continued with this policy of a dependence on imports of uh, gas and, and to a large extent oil from, from Great Britain. We have no gas storage. Uh, sometimes people say, well, why don't you use what's in the pipes? Well, you can't because if you use what's in the pipe without putting new gas in, of course, there's air intrusion, risk of explosions. We have almost no electricity storage. Um, we've got the 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 pumped, um, and this is not this is not unusual for Europe. Um, if you look at the total European gas storage, it's about three months, including, and a good chunk of that three months is in Western Ukraine. You know, so uh, we Europe and Ireland are not well equipped. Part of the solution to Ireland's dependence was interconnection, and that's why we have a 500 megawatt direct uh, current connector to Wales, and we're building one to Britain, which of course will be nuclear powered. Um, don't tell the Greens who have banned nuclear power in Ireland, but our grid is inadequate. And uh, um, uh, and in fact, uh, just um, two years ago, our Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland published a number on its um, website suggesting that as little as 55% of the power generated gets to the market. That's partly because of the rise of intermittency and also largely due to the very poor state of our um, grid. As a rule of thumb, you need to invest as much in the grid as you do in intermittent generation. And of course, we've only in Ireland invested a fraction of that. Uh, and we've got relatively limited connectivity. Now, much of Europe, to be fair, has better connectivity, especially Germany, Holland. Um, uh, but still, um, Europe is in a pretty poor way. Um, in Ireland's case, it's a particular shock because we're such a maritime country. And we've got basically, for the Republic of Ireland, we've got about 10 times the um, uh, maritime territory as our land territory, and about half that has petroleum basins. So really, there's no reason for Ireland not to have explored and developed some of its um, oil and gas, although it's effectively banned the development. Um, now, uh, I'm coming to the end of the time, so just some conclusions. Um, I would say European policy actually accelerates decline. Um, uh, and Europeans act as if we are the center of the universe, but of course we're not. You know, Europe last year was only about 50% of global primary energy. By Europe, I'm including Britain, as well as Ukraine and Eastern Europe, not Russia or Turkey. Um, and, um, and yet we act as if we're representative. And as you can see, China is now twice what Europe is, uh, which is a shocking statistic. You know, that's true in electricity and in primary energy. Um, and India is halfway there, growing rapidly. And even the United States by itself is bigger than all of Europe. Uh, and yet... Bizarrely, we prioritize greenhouse gas emission reduction, which effectively shifts output of hydrocarbons to dirtier, less productive locations. Uh, and in case you think this is hyperbola, like if, if you can actually measure the, um, the methane efficiency of, say, Groningen and Holland, Norwegian fields, uh, British fields, and uh, the Irish offshore fields, very low standard. I mean, index uh, on the index, it's about one for Northwestern Europe. Uh, you get two to three for um, uh, former Soviet Union. Well, uh, West Ukraine is disastrous, it's five, uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa is four to five. Uh, you know, so effectively shifting from domestic production, you don't just add the transport burden in terms of emissions, you actually increase the uh, fugitive methane and uh, other leakages. Um, and a similar, um, uh, counterproductive policy uh, policy occurs in, in agri output, where very often constraint on efficient European dairy and beef cattle is simply shifted to um, corn-fed uh, cattle in uh, Wisconsin uh, or, um, you know, stripping of natural forest in places like the Chapari in, in Paraguay or Bolivia, um, which, of course, has its own impact on emissions. Um, 
I'm not saying that there's not a role for environmental concerns and environmental protection, there is, of course, uh, but it should be balanced. Cost and benefits and risk should be balanced, and they're not in European policy. Um, and it, it, it to do if you cut, you want to cut uh, carbon emissions, it's relatively straightforward. You simply tax the emissions. At the moment, depending on which country you're looking at, um, in Ireland, it's it's about, what, 43 euros a tonne or so of carbon. Um, California is about, what, 28 US dollars. Uh, Australia, about the same in Aussie dollars, uh, and much lower for most uh, parts of the world. So if you really wanted to cut uh, carbon emissions, the answer is simple. You put a big carbon tax on it. And the Irish Greens, for example, have debated for $400 uh, euros a tonne. So it's it's not as if it hasn't been discussed. But that that's that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation, which they totally ignore, is that if you want behaviour that captures carbon, you have to reward the behaviour that captures carbon. But of course, in most countries, including Ireland, and I think in certainly in Bolivia, I don't know about Paraguay or Brazil, they do not allow the person capturing the carbon to benefit at all. The state captures the benefit of the carbon, uh, which, of course, is 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 completely contrary to the state of policy. Um, You know, you can you can talk all you want about re-wetting or planting forestry. And we do have grants for forestry. But um, we have examples in Ireland, and I think they've been repeated elsewhere in Europe, um, where there was an example in Carlo about two years ago, where a very go ahead farmer um, had a, uh, a series of projects to capture carbon. He had them audited by the university. Uh, he put them, he sold them to a local uh, manufacturer, um, which had a, a carbon budget. Uh, but then when it came to being audited, uh, the department refused to sign off on the um, the carbon credit, not because there was anything wrong with the calculation of the carbon credit, but purely because it was state policy in Ireland that the state used the carbon credit for the pet projects of the minister and the officials. And that, of course, is completely inconsistent with the stated desire to reduce carbon. If you if you want to reduce carbon, you tax carbon and you incentivize the people who are capturing carbon. And that's basic economics. So governments really must choose between control and market outcomes. And uh, uh, and that leads me to the conclusion that, uh, you know, the question we should ask ourselves is greenery as practice in Europe sustainable? You know, they talk about sustainable, but is greenery sustainable? The facts are that 80 percent of primary energy comes from fossil fuels. Now, when I was in school, it was about 85 percent. You you consider the trillions of subsidies and uh, preferential pricing, much of which is hidden, um, and the massive investment that's gone into uh, alternative um, renewables, and you've hardly shifted the dial. And the absolute level of fossil fuels is bigger now than it ever was before in history. True renewables have reached about 6% often loss-making. Hydro, uh, which has its own problems, uh, is only 5%. Intermittent renewables in a developed economy, a call in Germany, Ireland, require 100% backup. Um, now, maybe you get away with it, sub-Saharan Africa not having backup, but there are costs. You won't have server farm, you won't have data centers, you won't even have snake anti-venom. Um, uh, nuclear, is really the only low carbon source of electricity. And yet bizarrely, in countries like Ireland, we banned it under a 1999 act. And there's no real engagement on the subject. Uh, you know, So we pay lip service to low carbon, but we don't do the one thing that actually could deliver low carbon. Instead, we talk about electrification. Um, uh, but electrification uh, is only 23% of primary energy or 21% uh, of global. So yeah, it's important and it's growing, but you know, it's uh, only a fifth, uh, four fifths of the world's uh, primary energy is not uh, electrified. Uh, and of course, the, the new technologies that they're pushing through government policy are much less efficient than the traditional policies of, you know, a big uh, coal-fired plant um, in the center of the Ruhr going straight to the industrial users. Um, uh, if we were serious about protecting energy security, uh, we would have policies that achieve that objective. Instead, we've got amber alerts, high prices, Intel warning us that it's not going to expand here, limited storage and failed policy. What we should have is what the Norwegians do. The Norwegians talk the good talk you know, about environmentalism and you know, Norway, through its geography, uh, has a lot of hydro. Uh, but look at what Norway does rather than what Norway says. Norway is maximizing exploration, albeit with some protests and development and exports of oil, two million barrels a day from a relatively small country up there with some of the big uh, OPEC players, 
as big as, as Nigeria uh, or the Gulf states, uh, and gas, higher priced gas after the Nord Stream pipeline uh, explosions. And of course, the Norwegians have a $1.4 trillion fund. Why do they have such a big fund? Well, they, they, they don't state it. Politicians don't state it at all, like happens in many countries. Um, but what Norway does is very different from what European countries tend to say. Uh, and of course, we should also develop nuclear and LNG as a low carbon fuel. People talk about uh, using our old gas reservoirs as storage without understanding that it's actually quite energy inefficient to pump gas into a, um, uh, a semi-porous sandstone because people think, because they see too many uh, Simpsons cartoons, they think there's a big cavern you know, under the, uh, under the ocean. But of course, there's no cavern under the ocean. It would collapse if there were. What there is is, is sandstone or carbonate that has tiny pores. And the gas and oil comes out of those pores really by gas pressure and sometimes by water pressure. But to pump gas back into those pores requires a lot of energy. Uh, and of course, we could stockpile coal and uh, LNG for emergencies. I'm aware I've gone over the hour, so I will stop with, with that. And thank you, everyone, for listening.